Chapter Two of Fame and Fortune. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fame and Fortune, or the Progress of Richard Hunter, by Horatio Alger Jr. Chapter Two, Introduction to Mercantile Life. Frank Whitney was indeed surprised to find the ragged bootblack of a year before so wonderfully changed. He grasped Dick's hand and shook it heartily. "Uncle," he said, "this is Dick. Isn't he changed?" "It is a change I am glad to see," said Mr. Whitney, also extending his hand. "For it appears to be a change for the better. And who is this other young man?" "This is my private tutor," said Dick, presenting Fosdick, Professor Fosdick. He's been teaching me every evening for most a year. His terms is very reasonable. If it hadn't been for him, I should never have reached my present high position in literature and science. I'm glad to meet your acquaintance, Professor Fosdick," said Frank, laughing. "May I inquire whether my friend Dick owes his elegant system of pronunciation to your instruction?" "Dick can speak more correctly when he pleases," said Fosdick, "but sometimes he falls back into his old way." He understands the common English branches very well. <laughs> Then he must have worked hard, for when I first met him a year ago, he was as ignorant as a horse. Interrupted Dick, "It was you that made me ambitious, Frank. I wanted to be like you and grow up spectable." Respectable, Dick," suggested Fosdick. "Yes, that's what I mean. I didn't always want to be a bootblack, so I worked hard, and with the help of Professor Fosdick." I've got up a little way, but I'm going to climb higher. I am very glad to hear it, my young friend," said Mr. Whitney. "It is always pleasant to see a young man fighting his way upward. In this free country, there is every inducement for effort, however unpromising may be the early circumstances in which one is placed. But, young gentleman, as my nephew would be glad to speak further with you, I propose that we adjourn from the sidewalk to the Saint Nicholas Hotel." Where I am at present stopping. Yes, Dick," said Frank. "You and Professor Fosdick must spend the evening with me. I was intending to visit some place of amusement, but would much prefer a visit from you." Dick and Fosdick readily accepted this invitation, and turned in the direction of the Saint Nicholas, which is situated on Broadway, below Bleecker Street. By the way, Dick, where are your Washington coat and Napoleon pants now? They were stolen from my room. Said Dick, by somebody that wanted to appear on Broadway dressed in tip-top style, and hadn't got enough money to pay for a suit. Perhaps it was some agent of Barnum who desired to secure the valuable relics. Suggested Frank. By gracious! Said Dick suddenly, there they are now. It's the first time I've seen 'em since they were stolen. He pointed to a boy of about his own size who was coming up Broadway. He was attired in the well-remembered coat and pants, but alas, time had not spared them. The solitary remaining coat tail was torn in many places; of one sleeve, but a fragment remained. Grease and dirt nearly obliterated the original color, and it was a melancholy vestige of what it had been once. As for the pantaloons, they were a complete wreck. When Dick had possessed them, they were well ventilated, but they were now ventilated so much more thoroughly that. As Dick said afterwards, a feller would be warmer without any. That's Mickey Maguire," said Dick, a particular friend of mine that had such a great affection for me that he stole my clothes to remember me by. Perhaps," said Fosdick, "it was on account of his great respect for General Washington and the Emperor Napoleon." What would the great Washington say if he could see his coat now?" said Frank. When I wore it," said Dick, "I was sorry he was so great." Because it prevented his clothes fitting me. It may be necessary to explain to those who are unacquainted with Dick's earlier adventures that the clothes in which he was originally introduced were jocosely referred to by him as gifts from the illustrious personages whose names have been mentioned. Mickey Maguire did not at first recognize Dick. When he did so, he suddenly shambled down Prince Street, fearful perhaps that the stolen clothes would be reclaimed. They had now reached the Saint Nicholas and entered. Mr. Whitney led the way up to his apartment, and then, having a business engagement with a gentleman below, he descended to the reading room, leaving the boys alone. 
Left to themselves, they talked freely. Dick related fully the different steps in his education, with which some of our readers are already familiar, and received hearty congratulations from Frank, and earnest encouragement to persevere. "'I wish you were going to be in the city, Frank,' said Dick. "'So I shall be soon,' said Frank. Dick's face lighted up with pleasure. "'That's bully!' said he enthusiastically. "'How soon are you coming?' I am hoping to enter Columbia College next commencement. I suppose my time will be good deal taken up with study, but I shall always find time for you and Fosdick. I hope you will both call upon me. Both boys readily accepted the invitation in advance, and Dick promised to write to Frank at his boarding school in Connecticut. At about half-past ten the two boys left the St. Nicholas, and went back to their boarding house. After a comfortable night's sleep they got up punctually to the seven o'clock breakfast. It consisted of beefsteak, hot biscuit, potatoes, and very good coffee. Dick and Fosdick did justice to the separate viands, and congratulated themselves upon the superiority of their present fare, to that which they had been accustomed to obtain at the restaurants. Breakfast over, Fosdick set out for the hat and cap store in which he was employed, and Dick for Rockwell and Cooper's on Pearl Street. It must be confessed that he felt a little bashful as he stood in front of the large warehouse, and surveyed the sign. He began to feel some apprehensions that he would not be found competent for his post. It seemed such a rise from the streets to be employed in such an imposing building. But Dick did not long permit timidity to stand in his way. He entered the large apartment on the first floor, which he found chiefly used for storing large boxes and cases of goods. There was a counting room and office, occupying one corner, partitioned off from the rest of the department. Dick could see a young man through the glass partition sitting at a desk, and opening the door he entered. He wished it had been Mr. Rockwell, for it would have saved him from introducing himself, but of course it was too early for that gentleman to appear. "'What is your business?' inquired the bookkeeper, for it was he. "'I've come to work,' said Dick shortly, for somehow he did not take much of a fancy to the bookkeeper, whose tone was rather supercilious. "'Oh, you've come to work, have you?' "'Yes, I have.' said Dick independently. "'I don't think we shall need your valuable services,' said the bookkeeper, with something of a sneer. The truth was that Mr. Rockwell had neglected to mention that he had engaged Dick. Dick, though a little inclined to be bashful when he entered, had quite got over that feeling now. He didn't intend to be intimidated or driven away by the man before him. There was only one doubt in his mind. This might be Mr. Cooper— the second member of the firm, although he did not think it at all probable. So he ventured this question. "'Is Mr. Rockwell or Mr. Cooper in?' "'They're never here at this hour.' "'So I supposed,' said Dick coolly. He sat down in an armchair and took up the morning paper. The bookkeeper was decidedly provoked by his coolness. He felt that he had not impressed Dick with his dignity or authority, and this made him angry. "'Bring that paper to me, young man,' he said. "'I want to consult it.' "'Very good,' said Dick. "'You can come and get it.' "'I can't compliment you on your manners,' said the other. "'Good manners don't seem to be fashionable here,' said Dick composedly. Apparently the bookkeeper did not want the paper very particularly, as he did not take the trouble to get up for it. Dick, therefore, resumed his reading and the other dug his pen spitefully into the paper, wishing, but not quite daring, to order Dick out of the counting-room, as it might be possible that he had come by appointment. "'Did you come to see Mr. Rockwell?' he asked at length, looking up from his writing. "'Yes,' said Dick. "'Did he tell you to come?' "'Yes.' "'What was that you said about coming to work?' "'I said I had come here to work.' "'Who engaged you?' "'Mr. Rockwell.' "'Oh, indeed. "'And how much are you to receive for your valuable services?' "'You are very polite to call my services valuable,' said Dick. "'I hope they will be.' "'You haven't answered my question.' "'I have no objection, I'm sure. "'I'm to get ten dollars a week.' Ten dollars a week?' echoed the bookkeeper with a scornful laugh. "'Do you expect you will earn that?' "'No, I don't,' said Dick frankly. 
"'You don't?' returned the other doubtfully. "'Well, you're more modest than I thought for. "'Then why are you going to get so much?' "'Perhaps Mr. Rockwell will tell you,' said Dick. "'If you tell him, you're very particular to know, "'and we'll lose a night's rest if you don't find out.' "'I wouldn't give you a dollar a week. "'Then I'm glad I ain't going to work for you. "'I don't believe your story at all. "'I don't think Mr. Rockwell would be such a fool "'as to overpay you so much.' "'Perhaps I shouldn't be the only one in the establishment that is overpaid,' observed Dick. "'Do you mean me, you young rascal?' demanded the bookkeeper, now very angry. "'Don't call names. It isn't polite.' "'I demand an answer. Do you mean to say that I am overpaid?' "'Well,' said Dick deliberately, "'if you're paid for being polite, I should think you was overpaid considerable.' There is no knowing how long this skirmishing would have continued, if Mr. Rockwell himself had not just then entered the counting-room. Dick rose respectfully at his entrance, and the merchant, recognizing him at once, advanced smiling, and gave him a cordial welcome. "'I am glad to see you, my boy,' he said. "'So you didn't forget the appointment. How long have you been here?' "'Half an hour, sir. I am unusually early this morning. I came purposefully to see you.' and introduce you to those whom you will labor. Mr. Gilbert, this is a young man who is going to enter our establishment. His name is Richard Hunter. Mr. Gilbert Richard is our bookkeeper. Mr. Gilbert nodded slightly, not a little surprised at his employer's cordiality to the new boy. So the fellow was right after all, he thought. But it can't be possible he is to receive ten dollars a week. Come out into the ware room and I will show you about, continued Mr. Rockwell. How do you think you shall like business, Richard? Dick was on the point of saying, Bully! but checked himself just in time, and said instead, Very much indeed, sir. I hope you will. If you do well, you may depend upon promotion. I shall not forget under what a heavy obligation I am to you, my brave boy. What would the bookkeeper have said, if he had heard this? "'How is the little boy, sir?' asked Dick. "'Very well, indeed. "'He does not appear even to have taken cold, "'as might have been expected from his exposure, "'and remaining in wet clothes for some time. "'I am glad to hear that he is well, sir.' "'You must come and see him for yourself, Richard,' "'said Mr. Rockwell in a friendly manner. "'I have no doubt you will become good friends very soon. "'Besides, my wife is anxious to see and thank the preserver of her boy.' "'I shall be very glad indeed to come, sir. "'I live at number blank blank Madison Avenue. "'Come to-morrow evening if you have no engagement. "'Thank you, sir.' "'Mr. Rockwell now introduced Dick to his head clerk with a few words, "'stating that he was a lad in whose welfare he took a deep interest, "'and he would be glad to have him induct him into duties, "'and regard with indulgences any mistakes "'which he might at first make through ignorance. "'The head clerk was a pleasant-looking man, of middle age, named Murdoch, very different in his manners and bearing from Mr. Gilbert, the bookkeeper. "'Yes, sir,' he said. "'I will take the young man under my charge. He looks bright and sharp enough, and I hope we may make a business man of him in course of time.' That was what Dick liked. His heart always opened to kindness, but harshness always made him defiant. "'I'll try to make you as little trouble as possible, sir,' he said. "'I may make mistakes at first, but I'm willing to work, and I want to work my way up. That's right, my boy, said Mr. Burdock. Let that be your determination, and I am sure you will succeed. Before Mr. Murdoch begins to instruct you in your duties, said Mr. Rockwell, you may go to the post office and see if there are any letters for us. Our box is number 5,670. All right, sir, said Dick, and he took his hat at once and started. He reached Chatham Square, turned into Printing House Square, and just at the corner of Spruce and Nassau Streets, close by the Tribune office, he saw the familiar face and figure of Johnny Nolan, one of his old associates when he was a boot-black. "'How are you, Johnny?' he said. "'Is that you, Dick?' asked Johnny, turning round. "'Where's your box and brush?' "'At home.' "'You haven't given up business, have you?' "'I've just gone into business, Johnny.' I mean, 
"'You ain't given up black and boots, have you?' "'All except my own, Johnny. "'Ain't that a good shine?' "'And Dick displayed his boot, "'with something of his old professional pride. "'What you up to now, Dick? "'You're dressed like a swell.' "'Oh,' said Dick, "'I've retired from shines on a fortune, "'and embarked my capital in mercantile pursuits. "'I'm in a store on Pearl Street.' "'What store?' "'Rockwell and Cooper's.' "'How'd you get there?' "'They wanted a partner with large capital, and so they took me,' said Dick. "'We're going to do a smash in business. "'We mean to send off a ship to Europe every day, "'besides what we send to other places, "'and expect to make no end of stamps.' "'What's the use of gas, Dick? "'Tell a feller now.' "'Honor bright, then, Johnny. "'I've got a place at ten dollars a week, "'and I'm going to be spectable. "'Why don't you turn over a new leaf?' "'and try to get up in the world. "'I ain't lucky, Dick. "'I don't half the time make enough to live on. "'If it wasn't for the newsboy's lodging house, "'I don't know what I'd do. "'I need a new brush and box of blacking, "'but I ain't got money enough to buy one. "'Then, Johnny, I'll help you this once. "'Here's fifty cents. "'I'll give it to you. "'Now, if you're smart, "'you can make a dollar a day easy "'and save up part of it. "'You ought to be more enterprising, Johnny. "'There's a gentleman wants a shine now.' Johnny hitched up his trousers, put the fifty cents in his mouth, having no pocket unprovided with holes, and proffered his services to the gentleman indicated, with success. Dick left him at his work, and kept on his way down Nassau Street. A year ago, he thought, I was just like Johnny, dressed in rags and living as I could. If it hadn't been for my meeting with Frank, I'd have just been the same today, most likely. Now I've got a good place and some money in the bank. "'besides aristocratic friends who invite me to come and see them. "'Blessed if I ain't afraid I'm dreaming at all, "'like the man that dreamed he was in a palace "'and woke up to find himself in a pig pen.'" End of chapter 2